uh, a code word that you can include in there to make sure that you get your um, uh, pesticide recertification credits. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. And um, and the title of this presentation, hopefully we're all in the right spot, um, is Identification and Management of Winter Wheat Diseases. And I'm Tim Murray. Um, I'm a professor and extension plant pathologist at WSU. And um, when we talk about um, wheat diseases, um, there are in the Pacific Northwest, there are, are several that we um, are concerned about. We're not going to talk about all of them today. Um, several of the fungal diseases I've got listed here, and today we'll talk about stripe rust, eye spot, cephalosporin stripe, and the snow molds. And you can see the, the organisms that cause those diseases listed there. Those listed in green, like stripe rust, leaf rust, stem rust, those are uh, foliar diseases. Whereas those listed in brown, eye spot, cephalosporium, and so forth, those are all soil-borne diseases. There are also some virus and bacterial diseases of wheat um, that we are concerned about. Probably the, the most common virus disease that we worry about is barley yellow dwarf uh, virus. Um, last year, interestingly, we had uh, a few outbreaks of wheat streak mosaic. The virus is common, but it's not usually a problem for us. Uh, and similarly, soil-borne wheat mosaic is a relatively newly introduced disease, but it's limited really in its distribution really to the sort of the south central part of the state around uh, Walla Walla area. So um, if we were in that part of the state, we'd talk about that today, but we're not. So one of the things I'd like to do when I talk about uh, these diseases, first of all, is to to show this map, which shows our rainfall and, and relative temperatures across our, our production region. And they range from relatively low rainfall, less than, eight, uh, less than 10 inches of annual precip and relatively warm uh, daytime temperatures in the, in the central part of the state to cooler temperatures and, and greater rainfall in the, in the far eastern part of the state. And that's important because the diseases that we talk about are influenced strongly by temperature and moisture. And this chart that I put together, I've tried to uh, show that by, uh, in the red, that indicates uh, an area that would be higher risk for the disease, and green means lower risk for the disease. So if you look at something like stripe rust, um, it's pretty much a problem across all of our rainfall zones and in the irrigated region. Things like eye spot tend to be less severe uh, in the lower rainfall regions and more important in those intermediate and high rainfall regions. And then you've got uh, diseases like uh, the snow molds and fusarium crown rot, barley yellow dwarf, which can be important in the low rainfall regions, well, barley yellow dwarf in the high rainfall regions too, but fusarium and the snow molds, especially in the low rainfall regions. Now, for some of these diseases, things like eye spot, cephalosporin stripe, uh, pythium, even though they tend to be less of a problem in the low rainfall regions, some years under some conditions, they can be a problem. So it doesn't mean uh, just because you're in one of those areas that, that you may never see that disease problem. So when we start thinking about management considerations for these diseases, I'm breaking them down into, into three main categories, cultural practices, variety selection, and chemical control. And uh, cultural practices, we're gonna break down even farther in, in just a second, but, but variety selection and chemical control are, are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, and in this table, if I have a plus in the column, that means that that's an important consideration for control. If it's a minus, then um, not so much. So you can see things like stripe rust, cultural practices, variety selection, chemical control are all considerations. Things like rhizoctonia root rot, we really need to look at cultural practices because variety selection, chemical control are not so much of a concern. Things like soil borne wheat mosaic, really we're worried about variety selection mainly because cultural and chemical controls are just not available. So as I mentioned, when we talk about cultural practices, we have a lot of different uh, practices to consider. 
And you can see there in the left-hand part of this table, seeding date is one that affects all of these diseases to some extent. Um, it's probably the single most important cultural practice um, that we think about. Things like residue management, uh, whether you're in a no-till system or a conventional till or something in between, um, has an influence on some diseases, but not others. Green bridge management, which essentially means volunteer management, similarly is important for some diseases, things like stripe rust, rhizoctonia pythium, and barley yellow dwarf, but not so much for, for other diseases. Fertility, although it's very important for the crop, um, from a disease control point of view, there's really only a few diseases um, that we think about as it, as it being a real uh, management consideration. Uh, crop rotation, again, a good practice, but in terms of disease control, there's one disease, especially cephalosporin stripe, where we think about crop rotation. And then similarly, soil pH, you've probably heard a lot about soil pH. From a disease control perspective, soil pH has a strong influence on sep strike, has some influence on other diseases, but it's not, an, not, not a major consideration. And so we're gonna come back to these at the end again and, and sort of summarize uh, what we talk about over the next few minutes. So we're gonna start with uh, stripe rust. And what you see here is an example of a very classic sort of stripe rust symptom, these long sort of yellowish orange uh, stripes in the leaf. And that's where the name comes from, uh, stripe rust. This yellowish material, some people call it Cheeto dust, is actually spores of the stripe rust fungus. And these spores are spread by wind and can travel relatively long distances. In the right-hand uh, photo there, what you see is a field of a susceptible variety that is pretty uniformly infected with stripe rust. And when stripe rust is severe on a susceptible variety like this, it can have a very significant impact on, on yield, maybe more than 70% um, loss. Now, the stripes, the classic stripes for stripe rust are not the only symptom that you might see on infected plants. In the upper left uh, photo there, you see a scattering of these pustules over the surface of the leaf. And this is something that we call a seedling reaction. Very young plants, um, uh, when they're infected by stripe rust, don't show the striping that you see in, in the next uh, photo over, for example. Um, that third photo from the left on the top there shows that stripe rust can also be in the heads. That's uh, inside of a groom there that has stripe rust um, spores in it. And then in the, in the top right column there, you see this black spore stage. Um, this is a stage that we don't see all the time, um, but it is a survival spore of the stripe rust fungus. And one thing we know about stripe rust now that we didn't know before is that it can use barberry as an alternate host, just like the stem rust fungus can to complete its life cycle. Now, well, what we also know is in the Pacific Northwest, um, this is not important for stripe rust, so we're not really going to talk about that um, today. When we think about the factors that affect stripe rust, we think first about temperature and moisture. Uh, two most important factors, temperatures in the range of 50 to 64 degrees uh, Fahrenheit with about six hours of dew are optimal for infection by this fungus. Cool temperatures are good for disease development, that 50 to, to 64, even warmer. But once infection has occurred, um, the temperature is less important. That is until it gets up into about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the temperatures get into the 90 degree range, then the disease really uh, doesn't develop uh, very rapidly. Fall infection of uh, susceptible plants is really critical because the only place that the stripe rust fungus overwinters is on a living plant. And so the fall sown crop is infected by spores that are being produced on uh, spring crops that are later maturing, later harvested. And so when those plants are infected uh, in the fall, that's where the stripe rust fungus survives the winter. Uh, in the spring, then it starts to sporulate again on those infected plants and the spores spread and are what get the disease started in the following year. Winter survival uh, is also crucial to um, the development of stripe rust and especially temperatures during December, January, and February right now. Um, 
when temperatures are in the single digits and below, uh, especially when we have no snow cover, that is going to be detrimental to the striped rust fungus. The wheat plant can survive, but the striped rust fungus um, will not survive those lower temperatures. If we have moderate temperatures or if we have adequate snow cover to protect the plants from those low temperatures, then the striped rust fungus is going to survive um, uh, better through the winter and, and potentially be more damaging in the following spring. So when we think about what's going on right now, we're at the end of February. Uh, rust intensity last summer was, was moderate. It was not as severe as it's been in previous years, but we still had uh, plenty of striped rust around. However, as we had it, headed into the fall, we had a relatively uh, dry uh, fall in terms of precipitation, and we had normal to late planting dates and emergence. And that combined with that, that dry fall weather led, leads to sort of an average risk for um, stripe rust establishment. Um, however, November, December, January temperatures have been very favorable for um, survival. Dr. Chen, who is our USDA expert on stripe rust, put out his first forecast uh, last month and he called for severe rust based on his um, modeling of a very susceptible variety. And that was also combined with, with the presence of some infected plants in some early seeded fields. And so we're waiting right now. I expect Dr. Chin's next forecast will come out um, in the next couple of weeks um, to see what has changed um, since January. But, but what we know at this point is we need to be on guard for this disease. So when we think about uh, control options uh, for stripe rust, we think about green bridge management. Volunteer wheat uh, allows the stripe rust fungus to get established early in the fall. Uh, so we wanna try to avoid very early planting of commercial fields. Um, we wanna try to avoid excessive irrigation. Uh, furrow irrigation is better than sprinkler if that's an option. Uh, the most important uh, factor for stripe rust control is to plant a disease resistant variety. Now, sometimes when you hear people talk about stripe rust, you'll hear them talk about HTAP resistance, and that stands for high temperature adult plant resistance. There's two kinds of resistance for stripe rust. One is called seedling resistance, and one is called adult plant resistance. And the adult plant resistance is preferred because it is effective against all of the races of stripe rust uh, that are present in the region. The resistance ratings of varieties, if you look at something like the Seed Buyer's Guide, or if you look at um, the Small Grains website variety selection tool, it rates varieties on a one to nine scale, where one is the most resistant, nine is the most susceptible. And our recommendation is to choose a variety that's rated one to four. That would be resistant or moderately resistant. Those varieties in most years are not going to need a fungicide application uh, later on, okay? The other thing that we encourage people to do for stripe rust control, regardless of the resistance rating of the variety you plant, is to monitor the rust forecast, which I just told you about, to scout your fields uh, for the presence of rust, and then spray a fungicide when necessary. And when you're scouting your fields for rust, um, you want to think about the resistance rating of the variety. If it's a susceptible variety, those that are rated from five to nine, or when one to 5% of the plants have active rust, then you need to think about um, a, a fungicide application. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at uh, resistant varieties and there are a large number of, of varieties. We have a, a wide variety of, of growing conditions out there. What I always recommend is that you look at the variety testing results from plots that are uh, produced near where you farm, and then pick the most resistant variety that performs well in your region. And so here I have these broken down by um, uh, resistance rating, one to two, moderately resistant, three to four, moderate five, moderately susceptible, six, seven, and susceptible, eight to nine. We really recommend, uh, unless you have a really good reason for it, 
to avoid the varieties that are rated greater than four. Uh, if you do plant varieties rated greater than four, then you really need to be thinking about uh, fungicide application uh, using those criteria I just mentioned. Okay, so these are the resistant, uh, or these are the resistance ratings for winter varieties. Uh, we have the same thing for uh, spring varieties. Now's the time of the year when, when many of you are thinking about what you might be planting this spring. And again, we have the same recommendation if at all possible, plant a variety that's rated four or less. And there's a lot of options here um, that you can choose from. So one of the confusing things about stripe rust, um, I, I recommend that one to 5% uh, rust, but what does one to 5% rust really look like? Well, there's two different uh, types of ratings for rust. One is you may have heard of the infection type and that's shown in the top panel there, and that ranges from zero to nine. Uh, zero on the left there is a resistant reaction, and on the right, nine is a, is a highly susceptible reaction. And essentially, the more spores you see on the leaf uh, surface, the more susceptible uh, the variety. The intermediate reactions there in the middle, if you look at three, four, five, you'll see some striping, but you see less spore production. And that's one of the reasons why these varieties uh, are preferred. On the bottom is the percent um, severity scale, and it ranges from zero on the left to 100 on the right. And again, it has to do with uh, how, how much of the leaf surface is covered by uh, sporulating uh, stripe risk. And so if you look at one to five there in the lower left, what you see is it only takes about one to two pustules on a flag leaf to, to match that 5% uh, threshold. And, and I wanna emphasize again, when we're scouting for stripe rust, the most important leaf to protect is the flag leaf. So if you see one to two pustules on the flag leaf uh, and it's still before antesis, um, that's, that's a time when you should think about um, spraying a fungicide. So if you get to that threshold, then the next question is, what do you spray? And here's a table of fungicides that can be sprayed for the rust. Uh, and I've highlighted some of the very common fungicides used uh, for stripe rust in this table. Uh, propiconazole um, is, uh, is widely used. Um, that's in a product called Tilt. There are other, um, uh, propiconazole is now generic. So there are generic forms of propiconazole. Um, tebuconazole similarly is uh, generic. Uh, that's a, in a product called Folicure, um, both widely used. There are others down there, things like Reaxor, Quilt, and there are several other fungicides available that will be effective against um, stripe rust. Now, one of the important things to consider when you're making a fungicide application is the growth stage. Um, all of these fungicides have a harvest restriction and things like propiconazole, uh, the harvest uh, or the growth stage restriction is the end of anthesis or what we call peaks uh, growth stage 10.5.4. Other materials like tebuconazole have uh, an interval uh, so it's a 30-day pre-harvest interval. And so you need to look at the growth stage of your crop and um, how long it is before, you, before harvest and, and decide uh, whether these fungicides can be applied uh, or not. Okay, so how do you know if you're at anthesis or not? Well, on wheat, anthesis uh, starts when the anthers pop out in the middle of the head and then it progresses to both the top and the bottom. And so if you have a head that has anthers out in the middle only, you're at peak growth stage 10.5. If you see anthers from top to bottom, then you're at 10.5.4 or later. Okay, so that's a very important consideration. In general, uh, Dr. Chen does not re recommend making a fungicide application after anthesis. And the main reason for that is that it's uh, diminishing returns in terms of the effectiveness of disease control versus the response that you'll get in yield from that. So that's another um, consideration. What we really like to do again is to protect that flag leaf. And so when the flag leaf is first coming out and, and during the heading stage, uh, we really wanna protect that flag leaf. Okay.
Um, I'm going to move on now and we'll talk about eye spot uh, a little bit here. Eye spot is a soil borne disease. And in the photo on the left, what you see is a, is a clump of plants that have been pulled up and you see this sort of yellowish brown discoloration on the stem base. There's a lot of things that can cause discoloration of the stem base, but if you take those, um, uh, separate the stems, uh, wash those stems and remove the outer loose fitting leaf sheaths, and you see something like in the photo on the right where you have that elliptical lesion, it's got kind of that yellow brown color to it and that, that dark material in the center. That's really classic eye spot. And, and so you know you're dealing with eye spot if you see something like that. One of the problems with eye spot is that it can cause uh, lodging. The fungus grows into the true stem. It destroys the structural tissues and then causes the plants to fall over. And in a situation like shown in this photo here where you have widespread lodging, and if you were to look in there carefully, you would see that there are some also some whiteheads, some dead standing stems or lodge stems. Um, the potential yield loss in a situation like this is 40 to 50%. So it can be um, significant. When we think about the factors that affect eye spot, we think about the autumn temperatures again. Temperatures in the range of 40 to 50 degrees uh, Fahrenheit with rainfall, a cold, wet fall day is just perfect for eye spot. That rain splashes the spores of the eye spot uh, fungi around so that they can land on nearby plants and infect. This is a relatively slow developing disease, unlike stripe rust, which can develop very quickly. Eye spot develops slowly, and you're really not going to see symptoms until uh, well into the following spring. The other factor that influences eye spot is snow cover. Uh, when you have snow cover, spores are not splashing around. Temperature underneath that snow is close to freezing. And so the disease is not going to develop uh, rapidly at all. It's not going to die out, but it's not going to develop either. So if we have prolonged snow cover, that tends to reduce the severity of eye spot. So what do we know uh, right now? Well, it's similar to stripe rust in the sense that uh, we've had normal to late planting and emergence, relatively dry fall conditions, uh, reduced the risk for infection. Mild temperatures during the winter have allowed the disease to develop, uh, at least the temperatures during December uh, and January before we had this recent snowfall, uh, allowed the disease to develop um, to some extent, but I would still say we're kind of an average risk for susceptible varieties. Again, with eye spot, one of the things we recommend uh, in the spring is to scout fields of susceptible varieties prior to jointing in, or, in order to determine uh, how severe disease is and whether a fungicide application might be warranted. When we think about control of eye spot, um, we can think about cultural practices and especially seeding date. Uh, early seeded fields, uh, early seeded relative to the production area are at greater risk than fields that are seeded uh, on time or late relative to the production area. Resistant varieties are the number one recommendation that we have for control of eye spot. And then that's followed by uh, foliar fungicide application for susceptible varieties. So first, if we look at uh, eye spot ratings of, uh, uh, for winter wheat varieties. Why, you know, this, why isn't this talking to me? Am I doing wrong? Is there a question? Oh. Yeah. Here. Um, the, uh, I have the oh, wait, list of eye spot resistant varieties here uh, and the ratings uh, from the oh. seed buyer's guide for them. So you can see here that I've, I've listed varieties that are rated five and below. Um, Madsen there in the first column on the left uh, is our long-term standard uh, resistant variety. It has a rating of three. Uh, so things that are rated uh, in that area should be pretty good for, for eye spot. Now for these varieties, it's unlikely that you're gonna need a fungicide application but we always recommend that you scout your fields regardless of uh, resistance rating because no, even, the, even the resistant varieties uh, can lose yield when disease is severe. 
So how do you know uh, when to spray? And uh, it's, a it's a more difficult decision than for stripe rust, but, but I have what I call my 10% rule of thumb. A lot of times this is the stage when you're trying to make a decision about spraying for eye spot, you have these uh, smallish plants. And in this case, if you look closely, you can see that the lesion is actually below ground there in the, in the crown of the plant. Um, and so what we recommend is that when it's, when it's getting close to spray time, that you go out and you collect enough plants to give you about 50 stems. You wash those plants and you separate the stems into healthy and diseased. If you can see a, a lesion on there, or you think you can, then put it in the disease pile and consider spraying when you have five out of 50 uh, that are diseased. And that five out of 50 represents 10%. And, and we use that as a threshold because the way this disease develops, there's probably another 10% out there that are infected, but you can't detect uh, a lesion yet. Uh, that's just the nature of this disease. And that's why it's challenging to decide when to spray. So then the next question is what, what do you spray for eye spot? And there are these uh, products that are registered uh, right now for eye spot. Uh, the long-term standard is tilt topsin or propoconazole and thiophanate methyl. Uh, Altotopsin is, is relatively newer in our market, but that the active ingredient in there, cyproconazole, is similar to propoconazole. Thiophanate methyl is uh, the, what we use, well, the Topsin M product. And, and one of the issues here is that we know there is fungicide resistance uh, to this product in our region. Um, so it, depending on, on where the field is and, and how common fungicide resistant isolates are in that field, will have an impact on the efficacy of that product. Some newer things into the market, Nexacor and Preaxor, um, both have this uh, AI in them, the flux of peroxid, which is pretty effective against the eye spot fungi. They also contain a strobal urine fungicide, the peractostrobin, which is not as effective against the eye spot fungi. And the Nexacor has uh, the, the propoconazole in it as well. Then you look at a quilt topsin uh, mix down there, propoconazole, azoxystrobin, thiophanate methyl. Um, and uh, I'll tell you in that mix that the azoxystrobin uh, is not particularly effective against the eye spot fungi. So uh, that, that basically means that you've got a propoconazole, thiophanate methyl mix. And then Trivapro, I don't have a lot of experience with this one myself. This is a three-way uh, mix of propoconazole, azoxystrobin, and this other uh, AI in there that is uh, pretty effective against the eye spot fungi. So you have some, some choices there. Okay, moving on to uh, cephalosporium stripe. Uh, this is a disease that's relatively easy to, to diagnose when you see it in the field. These, these long yellow stripes uh, in the leaf blade. And if you look closely there, you can see that there is some brown streaks or necrotic streaking uh, in those leaves. And this is very uh, typical for cephalosporin stripe. Now, one of the things uh, that's, a, that's a characteristic of this disease is if you follow these stripes, they go from the tip of the leaf blade down uh, to where it attaches to the stem. And then it, it goes down that leaf sheath that wraps around the stem. And that's one way for sure to distinguish um, cephalosporin stripe. Sometimes you can get yellowish uh, stripes or streaks in the leaves but they don't go all the way down the leaf blade and, and down the leaf sheet. One of the things that can happen with cephalosporium stripe when it's severe is it causes these dead standing uh, whiteheads. And this is a, a susceptible variety shown here. And you can see the very short uh, stunted uh, whiteheads in the foreground there. And behind that, there are more greenish heads. And, and when this occurs, the yield loss can be very severe. Uh, it's about a one for one loss. So if you have 1% infected stems with whiteheads, you have about a 1% yield loss. So 10% translates to 10% to yield loss. So that's one of the reasons why we're concerned about this disease. Under uh, moderate conditions, um, you can have 5% uh, cephalosporin stripe in the field and not really even recognize it. The factors that affect cephalosporium stripe are similar um, to those for eye spot. 
uh, autumn temperatures in the 40 to 50 degree Fahrenheit with rainfall is really favorable for this disease. This fungus survives in straw of plants that were previously infected. And when these uh, temperature rainfall come about in the fall, the fungus uh, produces literally millions of microscopic spores that wash into the soil around the crown and roots of the plant. And that's where this fungus infects the plant. Soil freezing, uh, especially if we have those uh, kind of winters where we have uh, the freeze thaw cycles, um, makes cephalosporin stripe worse. We think that uh, the soil freezing causes uh, wounds in the, in the crown and the roots that allow the fungus to infect the plant easier. And then soil pH, this is a, a disease we've, we've recognized for, for about 20 years or more now that acid soils are more favorable to this disease than uh, neutral soils. And there's been quite a lot of work um, done on this to show that once pH gets below about 5.3, um, the severity of the disease increases uh, quite a bit. So when we think about control of cephalosporin stripe, uh, we think about cultural practices here, seeding date. Again, uh, when the crop is seeded early relative to the production area, disease is uh, going to be more severe or, or has the potential to be more severe, I should say. Um, crop rotation, again, this fungus only survives in straw of plants that it killed previously. And so in this case, allowing a good three-year rotation will allow a lot of that straw to decompose and reduce the, the potential for, for disease. And then lastly, soil pH modification. If you have soil pH that's uh, below 5.3, 5.3 or below, um, uh, consider uh, doing something liming to raise that pH because that can have a big impact on how severe cephalosporin stripe is. And then lastly, uh, resistant or tolerant varieties. And I say tolerant varieties here because um, we don't have great resistance to cephalosporin stripe like we do to eye spot or stripe rust. Um, we can have varieties that tolerate the disease. Uh, things like l uh, do pretty well when cephalosporin is severe, but even those varieties uh, can be damaged. So I want to just show you uh, an illustration here of this P soil pH effect that I was talking about. This is an experiment that was done many years ago in some raised soil beds uh, by a former uh, student here in our department. And uh, basically what they did was to take field soil that was about 5.7 pH and they lowered it to 4.5 and they raised it to 7.5, so there was 4.5, 5.5, 6.5, 7.5. I'm just showing you the extremes here. And then they planted a susceptible variety and inoculated three rows and left three rows uninoculated. And you can see on the left there, pH 4.5, it's very clear which three rows were inoculated because you have severe disease and extreme stunting. But on the right where soil pH was 7.5, um, you can't tell which three rows were inoculated. And that's one of the reasons why we recommend um, uh, considering uh, liming if you have low pH soils. And many of our soils across the region now are down in that pH uh, five range. Okay. So uh, I mentioned uh, resistance or tolerance to cephalosporin stripe. Uh, and here's a list of varieties that are more tolerant of cephalosporium. Um, again, I recommend looking at the, the variety testing data uh, for the plots near where you farm. And then if cephalosporin stripe is, is a problem for you, consider planting the most tolerant variety um, that performed well in that plot. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the change gears again and talk about the snow mold diseases. Uh, this is a, a group of diseases that develop uh, on wheat that has been under snow for a prolonged a period of time. Um, the length of time depends on the particular disease, but in our region, uh, these diseases are combined uh, mainly to the Waterville Plateau. But there have been years when we've seen uh, one of these diseases, pink snow mold, spread pretty widely across our wheat producing area. 
So the photo there that you can see, um, the snow is receding. I took this photo within a couple of days of the snow melting back. And what you see on the surface there is this mildew-like appearance uh, on those plants. Um, and that's a, a sure sign of snow mold. In our area, there are actually four different snow mold diseases uh, that occur. The two on the top, speckled snow mold and pink snow mold, are the ones that we uh, see the most frequently and are our biggest problems. The two on the bottom uh, are less common and uh, less damaging uh, for the most part. Um, when snow mold is a problem, and, and this is a photo that I, I took in some of our plots uh, several years ago, in the, in the upper left, what you see there is a, is a photo of the plot. And in the foreground there, uh, you see that plot that has a very white um, uh, looking appearance to it. And if you come back two months later and you look at that same plot, you see that the plants are dead. And that's an example of the severity uh, or the, how severe snow mold can be when you have a susceptible variety. Our main form of control for uh, snow mold diseases is to plant a resistant variety. And we, I included a list of uh, resistant varieties here. Um, this is something that the breeders are actively working on, continue to work on. Um, and um, so there are some options. And if you're in that area where you know snow mold is a problem, I suspect you're already pretty familiar with these varieties. So I want to just touch on a couple of other diseases uh, before we kind of summarize here. One of those is barley yellow dwarf. This is one of the virus diseases that I mentioned uh, early on. And what you see here in, these, in, the, in the upper left is a field with uh, barley yellow dwarf. And, and what you're seeing there, kind of these scattered uh, yellowish discoloration uh, in the wheat. Uh, there in the lower right, what you see is a more typical kind of barley yellow dwarf symptom which is a, a yellowing of the leaf tips. Now, if we were to look at that uh, up close, you would see that those leaf tips also were kind of sharp. They, they tend to be thick and leathery um, and, um, and have a sharp point to them. Some of the symptoms I just mentioned, uh, the discoloration, especially of the leaf tips. Barley, it looks more yellow. Uh, wheat it, or, and rye, it could be purple to red. And in oats, it's more red. Um, you get that twisting of the, of the symptomatic leaves with the sharp leaf tips, and sometimes that's a real giveaway. Uh, the leathery texture of those leaves, uh, as well as the stunting of the plants. And we see it mostly above ground, but when yellow dwarf is severe, the root system is also um, stunted, and that's what leads to some of the, the problem with the disease. Now, barley yellow dwarf is spread by uh, an aphid vector. And so when you look at the pattern of symptoms in a the field, they tend to uh, go in the direction of the wind. And in the field in the upper left, what you see is that the disease is, is more severe there on, on the left-hand edge of the field and then uh, becomes less severe as you move to the right. In the lower right, there is an irrigated circle in the Columbia Basin that had very severe aphid flights into it. And you see uh, that nearly the entire field is affected um, by the virus. There are several different aphids that can transmit barley yellow dwarf in our region. Um, the most common one is the uh, a bird cherry oat aphid there in the, in the center of the screen. Um, depending on where you are and which year, um, the uh, English grain aphid there in the lower right uh, can also be important. Rose grass aphid sometimes. Corn leaf aphid and the green bug are not so important in our region, but they are in other parts of the, of the U.S. So when we think about barley yellow dwarf management, um, we have some um, cultural controls, mainly uh, seeding date. Uh, barley yellow dwarf is a uh, greatest risk in fields that are seeded early relative to the production area. Uh, the green bridge or, vec, uh, or uh, um, volunteer uh, is also important because that serves as a host for both the virus and for the aphid vectors. 
chemical control and insecticide seed treatment can be uh, useful for um, controlling the aphid vectors if you're, especially if you're in an area where you know this is common. Um, that can limit the, in the uh, spread of the disease after uh, the aphids move into the field, but it won't prevent the initial establishment of the, of the disease. And then lastly is resistance. And unfortunately for wheat, we don't have good sources of resistance like we do in barley, rye, and oats. So we really need to think about uh, those cultural controls in, in a insecticide seed treatment. I want to show you an example here. This is one of the best examples I've ever seen of a seeding date response. Uh, this was a field that was along Highway 26 uh, many years ago. The grower started to seed the field and made a pass around the outside and then stopped um, for a week to do something else and then came back and resumed seeding. And you can see right to the line uh, where the aphids moved into that early sown wheat and, and but then did not move into the later seeded wheat. So great example of, of the impact that you can have with seeding date management. Okay. Rhizoctonia root rot is another uh, soil-borne disease. This is sometimes called bare patch disease. Uh, that's what they called it in Australia. The thing is, in our climate, we don't always see it as patches in a field. Sometimes the entire field can be affected by rhizoctonia, and, and what you tend to see is a very erratic uh, kind of a stand, an uneven stand. If you pull up plants uh, and wash off the roots, you see the brownish discoloration on the roots as you see in there in that lower right panel. And then also the spear tipping of roots. Um, this fungus uh, basically eats away at the cortical tissue of the root and leaves the, the vascular cylinder there. So you get that little spear tip on the root. Okay, lastly, uh, I wanna mention Fusarium crown rot. Uh, this is a very widespread disease across the inland Pacific Northwest. Um, it's caused by a couple of different fungi. It infects the roots, uh, uh, establishes itself in the crown, and then basically chokes off the water supply to the plant. And in that left-hand panel there, what you see are some standing uh, whiteheads, dead standing stems or whiteheads. Very common symptom of, the, of this disease. If you were to pull up plants uh, earlier in the year, in that upper right-hand panel there, you can see the uh, stem-based discoloration. In this case, it's kind of a uniform uh, chocolate brown color uh, discoloration on the subcrown inner node. Um, and if you were to cut through those crowns, you can see this brown discoloration uh, present in the crown. And as I said, one of the main um, ways that this disease causes damage is to choke off the water supply. <clears throat> and so in that lower right panel, when that happens, uh, not only do you get a reduction in yield, but you get a significant reduction in test weight. And so this can be a real problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's circle back around to our management considerations. These are the things we talked about in the beginning. Now I've added in uh, some yellow highlighting. And this yellow highlighting indicates what are the most important considerations for control of these diseases. And so you can see with things like stripe rust and eye spot, variety selection and chemical control are our main considerations. Cultural practices can have an impact, but not as big an impact. Things like uh, cephalosporium stripe, we can think about cultural practices and variety selection. Uh, for others, uh, like the snow molds and soil borne wheat mosaic, we really only have uh, variety selection. Uh, as an option, whereas for others like um, Pythium and, and Barley Elidorf, uh, both cultural and chemical controls can be a consideration. So again, the yellow highlighted columns show you uh, those, those uh, practices that can have the greatest impact on reducing disease. When we zero in on the, on the, on the cultural management practices, Again, the same thing holds here. Uh, the yellow are the most, those that have the greatest impact. And you can see that essentially for all of these diseases, um, that seeding date is uh, an important factor. 
for, for most of these diseases, things like stripe rust, eye spot, cephalosporium, uh, fusarium, uh, you really want to avoid very early seeding or early seeding relative to the production area. For things like uh, pythium, uh, it's actually the reverse. Uh, later seeding tends to be worse. Uh, very late seeding tends to be worse than on time or early. For things like rhizoctonia, uh, that's where we really need to think about residue management. This is one that is going to be more severe uh, in reduced till kinds of systems. Uh, green bridge management is important for stripe rust, rhizoc, and uh, pythium all because those volunteer plants serve as a reservoir of the pathogen. Um, and then fertility, we think about that some with fusarium. Uh, in general, with fusarium, because it tends to be more severe in the lower rainfall areas, we, we really recommend fertilizing for yield potential, not over fertilizing with nitrogen fertilizer. That tends to lead to larger plants that, that suffer more from the disease than those that are fertilized, um, more targeted for the rainfall. Crop rotation, I mentioned earlier, sap stripe and soil pH management really uh, focus on, on cephalosporium stripe. So um, that brings us to the end of my comments. We've got a few minutes for questions. I've got some resources up here for you. Uh, the Wheat and Small Grains website, smallgrains.wsu.edu. Uh, we have a lot of this information available online for you there. Um, I'm recording this presentation and I'm hoping to be able to put that on our website as well uh, so that you'll be, be able to access it later. Um, I have a Twitter account there at WSU Wheat Doc. I put out information uh, relevant to wheat diseases. Uh, Dr. Chen puts out a stripe rust alert uh, beginning in January of each year. You can access that directly at uh, striperustalert.wsu.edu. But every time Dr. Chen puts out uh, an alert, I, I put something out on our small grains website and I, uh, I, I tweet something out so that everyone knows that that's available. Variety ratings uh, for all of these diseases are available in the uh, Washington State Crop Improvement Association Seed Buyer Guide and uh, the variety selection tool on the smallgrains.wsu.edu website. And so again, to get credit for today's uh, presentation, you need to access this uh, document, the link I've put in the chat box and the code word for today's presentation is green. You'll need to add that to your form um, for, um, in order to receive credit, okay? So with that, I am happy to open this up for questions. If you have them, I think you are all unable to mute yourselves if you have a question. Questions, anybody? Okay. okay. I'm not hearing any questions. Everything was either clear as it could be, or nobody wants to speak up. Okay, well, um, that's, let's see, are there in the chat? Okay. Where are you going to post the, the link uh, to this chat? Can you put the link in on your chat? I've got the link to, um, I've got the link to the uh, Google document here in the chat. I will remain, uh, I will keep this open uh, for a little bit. I encourage you to um, access that document now if you can. Uh, if you still need the link uh, after this closes and you weren't able to get it, um, um, feel free to email me and I'll, I'll put it out. Um, do you have any tips on soil temp and seeding dates? Um, 
yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends on the disease uh, and, and where you're at. Um, you know, seeding date is one of those issues that varies across the region. In general, the drier and warmer you are, the earlier the seeding dates occur. So things in the Horse Heaven Hills might be seeding uh, around the 1st of September, whereas in Pullman, a more optimal seeding date would be somewhere around the 25th of September. Um, it, it really depends. Uh, some of these diseases like uh, Fusarium are favored by warm soil conditions um, and warm is, is relative. So uh, uh, delaying seeding a little bit, giving time for the soil to cool down can help reduce the potential uh, for that disease. Soil, in terms of soil temperatures, um, myself, you know, I like to see a soil temperature, you know, I think an optimal for, for emergence of weed is, is around uh, 60 degrees right in there. I think uh, something like, um, I think that's about 50, uh, 65 or so is uh, that 60 to 65 is optimal for growth. Can you repost the Google Doc for CCA credits? It's not showing on my chat. Can you go look at the, can you scroll to the top of your chat? Let's, uh, and see if you can find it there. I, let me see if I can uh, repost it here. There we go, there it is again for you. Okay, there was a lot of tan spot down around Pelotus this past year. Can you speak to that at all? Well, when when somebody when I when I hear a tan spot uh, in our region, the first thing I think of actually is physiologic leaf spot. So, and the reason I say that is because physiologic leaf spot looks a lot like tan spot, um, and the tan spot pathogen is very uncommon across our region. And so, um, I really want to double check. To make sure that that's that that's tan spot, uh, tan spot or a physiologic leaf spot is uh, a manifestation of chloride deficiency. And so, um, if you're seeing what you think is tan spot, um, I would double check. Uh, we we um, we uh, lost our diagnostician this year. Many of you know Rachel Baumberger changed jobs. We're in the process of of searching for a new diagnostician uh, now. But if you have something that you think is, is tan spot or physiologic leaf spot, you're not sure, I encourage you to send us a sample into the diagnostic lab and we can help you uh, make sure what, what you're dealing with. Okay. Have I seen any success in dormant seeding spring wheat? Um, I am not probably the best person to answer that question. I know there has been some uh, experimentation with that. Um, I would talk to our variety um, testing coordinator, Clark Neely, um, to see what his experience has been with dormant seeding in spring wheat. Okay. Okay. Just trying to look at your questions here in the chat box. We're going to post a link in this chat. I already got the link posted there for you. Um, okay. Other, I'm not seeing any questions. I don't see the link. Um, in my, well, in, in my box, in my chat box, I am seeing the, the link. Let me post it again here. And let's see, just direct message. Let's see, um, just in weeks. Okay, Linda Chan has posted the link again to everyone. Okay. Again, you need to use that code word green for today's presentation. Um, and thanks everybody for your participation today.
<laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone.